Hello, I'm Matt Kelly. And I'm Matt Dancona. And this is the all-new Two Mats for the week ending Friday the 10th of May. Now with disagreements, it says here. <laughs> now with added disagreements. <laughs> we do. We don't fall out, but we do have a good... Uh... It's not domestic. No, no, no. No, we didn't have to call the Rosers, but um, I, I really enjoyed it, actually. I think it's, I did. I think, I think it should be more of it. And I think you're right. We conversations like the one that is about to follow are absolutely essential, I think. And and, and they are too few in number because yeah. we it, politeness is an overrated virtue Fuck sometimes. Off. Fuck it's off! Right. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the founder of the New European. <laughs> what, did, what did we argue about? Um, we argued about Gaza, and then we agreed cloyingly mm. about Withenal and I. We did, and it Bernard was, Hill. It was like makeup podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Well, I hope you guys enjoy it. This is The Two Mats, episode 44. Thank you for listening. Enjoy. So, Matt, what are we talking about this week? Well, there's lots on, but I, I, I've been dwelling, brooding even, mm. upon a point you made on a previous podcast about the whole Gaza conflict being a, like a pebble. Mm. That's or a hit, rock. Yeah. Or a rock yeah. that's sort of hit the water and sent ripples literally everywhere. Mm. And that in turn reminded me of the New Yorker writer Dexter Filkin's book, uh, The Forever War, about Afghanistan and Iraq. But... It's sort of like Gaza is turning out very, you know, in very short order, that's seven months, to be the everywhere war. Yes. And, it, you know, it, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the way, I mean, there's lots we can say about what's going on specifically this week in terms of the conflict itself, but, but also how it's spread everywhere in the yeah. culture. And I thought one of the, it, because this is the week of the Eurovision Song Contest and we're recording this on Thursday, which is the night of the second semi-final, a lot of the, a lot of the, most of the oxygen in, into this tr- traditionally sort of quite fun and jolly occasion has been sucked up by the fact that Israel is cont- is competing as it as it often does. It's actually hosted it three times, yeah. And the entrant is a singer, twenty year old singer called Eden Golden. And I thought it might be interesting to uh, just to take a clip of a interview she did with ITV News giving a taste of like what it's like to be a you know a Eurovision Song Contest contestant yes suddenly in the middle of this this, of this there's a lot of people saying that you shouldn't be here how do you take that people can say whatever they want they have a right to speak their mind speak their heart I'm focusing on my mission and on the good and on the fact that we are united here by music. I'm a singer. That's the entire point. I'm not everything else. I'm a singer. I create music. So you you get you know you get a you get a taste of it, I guess. She's I mean she's not right mm. uh, in the sense that they're not united by music. No. Witness the fact that and this is I, when I read this I was really blown away that the head of Shin Bet, which is the you know, tough guy security agency, the Israeli security agency, Ronan Barr, has actually been to see the site in Malmo, right? So, Mm -hmm. and then in terms of being united, well, you know, we've already had the wonderfully named Irish contestant, Bambi Thug, who I think (laughs) (laughs) kind of, I I wanted to win already, right? Yeah. It it told reporters that that she'd been forced to change. She'd got a subliminal message on, uh, in various messages written on, her face and leg in an ancient Irish language which read ceasefire and freedom for Palestine and right, they were told right. can't, can't have that and um, and the Israeli contestant she's had to change the she lyrics she had to change the lyrics yeah, it was yeah. originally called not too subtly October Rain I think yeah. we can all guess yeah. what that was about and then a Swedish singer who took part in one of the events this week because uh, it's turned into a big jamboree now the Eurovision Song Contest appeared on stage with his uh, wrist wrapped in a kafir, a sort of Palestinian symbol so that's got him into trouble and Oli Alexander, who, yeah. who will be in the final 
because he's the British. He's contestant, the, Brit- the yeah. British contestant, and he gets in. I didn't know this. So the, the, the Brit British contestant gets in automatically. What so, like this? We've got a security council. There, there is a Eurovision yeah. Security yeah. Council, right? <laughs> so Oli Alexander is going to compete on Saturday, but he's been under huge pressure from groups like Queers for Palestine to withdraw, and has spoken out about you know a similar sort of line about we're here to do music. And, yeah. But I, I guess the the reason that I'm, it's, it may be an odd way in, but it it did occur to me apropos of your remark of the stone falling into the yeah the and the pond, ripples and the ripples yeah. that that you know when we were kind of did our first podcast after October the seventh and it sort of shell shocked you know just wondering where it was going yeah I mean it was obviously something new something terrible we correctly anticipated that the Israeli retaliation would be you know a, a terrible slaughter and it has been. I don't think either of us would have guessed that we'd be sitting here in May talking about the impact of the conflict on the Eurovision Song Contest. It's, it's, it, it has been an absolutely incredible after effect, hasn't it? I yes, mean, it has. In, in every regard and at every level. The fact that, you know, we've, we've seen this and we can talk about the horrific scale of the retribution that's been visited upon yeah, yeah. Gaza the awful trauma that the Israelis are still going through with yeah. many hostages still missing. You know, th- that was, I guess, kind of the predictable side of things. Yes, I mean, I think we, 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 we would have said, and I think we did say, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, not a great person to have at the helm in yeah. a crisis like this. Yeah. Uh, Hamas, you know, uh, brutally uh, committed to a kind of human sacrifice strategy where civilians were packed into you know, very heavily populated areas, which would be targets. Yeah. Uh, this was not going to go well. I think the kind of uh, the kind of military combat side of things we would perhaps have yeah. predicted. But but the, there's a sort of cultural dimension to this, which is political as well. But it's but it's the way that it's seeped into the bones of the entire kind of global culture. I yeah. mean, just looking at local elections, you know, people are still scouring the local election results for meaning and what does this mean? You know, and, and you have a lead city councillor called Mothin Ali, a green councillor, and he, uh, after he was elected uh, in the Gipton and Hare Hills ward in Leed, Leeds, said Allah Akbar and declared the, uh, the, the his victory a win for the people of Gaza. And then, of course, people started doing social media archaeology on him and found that on the day of October the 7th, he'd had, Ali had said on social media that the Palestinians had the right to fight back on the right. day itself. So uh, without going into the rights and wrongs of it, and, uh, you know, he, the point has been made, and I think this is legitimate, that Allah Akbar is, although we're, we've become used to it as a sort of, in, in the context of suicide terrorists. Yeah, but it's just a... It just means God is great, right? Course, right. Yeah, so yeah. that, I, I think, you in know... In Morocco, the other, where we were in Morocco the other day, of course, every prayer right. chant that goes uh, right. out starts it's, Allah Akbar. Right, so, know, so, so I, 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 I think that normal. getting worked yeah. out about that is... Yeah. Saying it's a win for the people of Gaza just seems to me untrue. But, you know, he's entitled, it seems to me, to yeah. say that. But what what I'm, I'm I'm you know without getting into the sort of weeds of the rights and wrongs, I, I think it is interesting that this is now uh, something of an issue for Labour. I mean, it was interesting that independent candidates made net gains of ninety three seats, and and you know the, losing control of a place like Oldham yeah. for the first time in thirteen years. There there is a there is a backlash. I think there are two two elements or layers of that backlash that they need to worry about very intensely. One is the obvious, the Muslim layer, yes. where increasingly they are being, there's a disassociation yeah. with Labour because of the policy of yeah. twinning with, with, with Sunak's kind of uh, policy with Israel, which you can say whatever you like, you know, but Starmer hasn't gone out on a limb on it, which is what they want him to do. They haven't broken bipartisanship, put but it the that other, way. The other layer, which I find much more interesting, is the generational layer. Yes, yeah. And the and fact that young people have adopted this cause. 100%. Know. And I think that leads us, nice segue, as we've learned to say, onto campuses yeah. and We've talked a bit about America and we should perhaps talk a bit more about what, what's been going on on campuses. But it's interesting that the the protests have now spread in, in not not on not as big a scale as they have in America, but but to the UK and and 
to Ireland, where in Trinity College Dublin, uh, today Thursday, the the university authorities have agreed to divest from Israel. So you know that, that that's right, quite right, a big yeah. you know moment. Then on the mainland, you've got hundred students storming the Library of Goldsmiths in London. Uh, you've got students at the University of Edinburgh beginning a hunger strike. You've got fourteen or fifteen encampments, not on the scale of America, but it but it's it's real and it's happening. Yeah. And today, Thursday, Rishi Sunak met university vice chancellors to talk about anti-Semitism on campuses. And so, you know, it, it's now a clear and present issue in yeah. British higher education as well as American I, higher education. I, I, just to dot the I's, the, the thing they want when you speak about the divestment from Israel. Yes, sorry, they, I should the, have said. There is a, a comprehensive list, isn't yeah, it, of companies yeah. that... I mean, university in Israel, and they you, want people to back away from them. Universities in this country don't have anything like the wealth that um, universities in America do. But to the extent that they do and they invest, you know, that the, there are there are there are companies that are, are directly invested in uh, Israel or indirectly, and so that is has always been a big. I mean, long before October the seventh and this conflict has long been a, a demand of pro Palestinian students. You know that they not universities not invest in Israel. Yeah. But this is this has become much more heated, and so there's a, there's that, and then there's the, uh, the 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 Jewish Jewish students saying in in ways formal and informal. Well, look, you know, okay, everyone has the right to protest, uh, and I, and I, as you know, I, you know, ferociously believe in that right. But at the same time, people have the right not to be harassed on campus. So, and this is where it gets it gets tricksy because what the language means is means different things to different people. So to Jewish ears, globalize intifada means kill all Jews. Right. You know, you know, the debate on what is Zionism can easily tip into the anti-Semitic trope that Jews do not have the right to self-determination in their own state. Yeah. And, and, you know, more, more, more sort of, straightforwardly the 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 incidents that are clocking up of jewish students feeling they can't wear symbols of their jewishness on campus and that they're being shouted at Mm. and so on you know this is this is a this is a very fraught environment and it it speaks to a perception i think that a lot of progressive students in this country and in america think that the foundation of the state of israel in 1948 was a greater historic injustice than the Holocaust. Yes. And that is obviously... You know, contestable. <laughs> contestable, but also it, it, it creates... You know, I, I'm conflicted because I, I, I don't like the line that, you know, there shouldn't be protests, there shouldn't be... Because, I, you know, although I've sort of said some pro-Israel things, I absolutely 100% believe... You know, in the idea of the university, the idea that it should be a place of free speech, free assembly. You know, if you don't like what Israel's doing in Gaza, you know, have at it. You know, have your encampment, say things, speak up. That's the point of being, yeah. you know. But at the same time, I want Jewish students to be able to yeah. go about their business. So, so one thing that I heard recently, which I, I suddenly fell into sympathy with, with this young woman who was an American student, can't remember her name, can't remember which university, I think it was Columbia, but she was describing, she was on the Palestinian side and she was describing what they wanted and the efforts that they were taking on the campus and why they were so passionate about it. And this question was raised uh, about the Jewish students. And she said, well, some of my fellow students confuse discomfort with harassment. Yeah. And I did think, and of course, like everything, there's a spectrum here and like everything in this route nothing is black and white nothing is is clear but i did think there is on both sides a tendency to uh, remember that words are words you yeah. know and that an argument can be had well, and there's nothing until someone punches you in the face then you shouldn't really be afraid of of, of i that, mean I, you know? I, yes except that i think that we can agree that when free speech tumbles into sort of racial harassment 
yes. neither of us are. So, but I don't think that is that what I don't, well, it, you know, is it, that it, what's happening? Yes, I mean, in Colombia, the "Go back to Poland" slogan I think was pretty really? clear. Yeah, where did, where, I didn't see that. Yeah. yeah, and we don't want no Zionists here. And then mm. a, a, a particular leader who has been disciplined, Kamani James, who said Zionists don't deserve to live. But I think I think the other thing that Jewish students want is a level playing field because it is nothing short of hilarious to hear pro-Palestinian protesters on American campuses talking about, you know, basically man up to Jewish students when every other minority group on American campuses have been declaring for the last five years that they have a right to a safe space, that they feel, you know, uh, physically and, and psychologically attacked Mm. by the presence of speakers on on campus i mean which is it yeah is it that well does it have to be either or yes they, it, yes it it do, yes of course it does because you know you you have if you incline as i do and i think you do to the everyone has to put up with a measure of discomfort yeah right not everything that is offensive in, is in fact not much that is offensive amounts to harassment yes but for the but it is incontestable for the for the last 50, 10 to 15 years especially 2014 and jonathan height the, the excellent american psychologist has plotted this brilliantly you know american campuses have become zones where all sorts of forms of speech about trans about Black Lives Matter, about Me Too, about, you know, have been simply impossible mm. because people say they don't feel safe. Now, which is it? You mm. know, are, are we saying that certain minorities are entitled to protection from speech and others aren't? Well, is it, so to take the case of trans. The reason it's impossible, isn't it, is it, what, what you mean is it's impossible to argue against it because that argument has been declared verboten. Yes, you know, and, and, and of... I also mean that speakers have been no platform. And, yes. And, you know, and, yeah. you know, and, and I, I think that the, one of the reasons that Jewish people feel sore at the moment is that they've, particularly on campuses, is that they've watched this culture where free speech has been dwindling. Yeah. And then suddenly it's, you know, well... It's an explosion stick, of free speech. And, and it's yeah. sticks yeah. and stones, you know. Yeah. Now... Right. Yeah, you have to choose, and I think American campuses are at a fork in the road here mm. because they have to they have to decide: are they going to be, you know, just basically creches for children, for adults, right, where yeah. no one is exposed to ideas and thoughts that they might find hurtful, yeah, or are they going to be actually what universities should be, which is place of lively uh, uh, and sometimes you know fierce debate. Not, you know, harassment to racial hatred, not, not, not incitement to racial hatred or, yeah. or violence yeah. or vandalism. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. But I think... I think. But the, is your sympathy then with uh, excluding the not cases with the, you know, Zionists must die and all of this mm. nonsense, excluding those extreme people, is, is your sympathy with the protesters? Yes, it yeah. is. I mean, I, I, uh, the protesters who are, to be clear, the protesters who are saying which is not what I believe, you know, the whole Israel strategy is wrong and should be stopped tomorrow. And, uh, you know, this is all Israel's fault. They have 100% the right to say that. How does how does this compare to Vietnam then? In well, Vietnam is really interesting because I, I wrote my column in this week's yeah. European about this and, and the sort of echoes of 1968. And they are there and they are there. And we might talk a little bit about the implications for Trump v Biden but there are there are differences and I think one of the key differences was that the the, the anti-Vietnam uh, protests were protests against governments hmm. and generals and the man yes. right the problem with this one is of course they they're also protests against governments the American government the Israeli government and so on yeah. but they're also protests against so-called Zionists right which means in practice Eddie from next door, you know, you you find yourself protesting against your fellow students, and yeah. that's different, yeah. and it, it creates a different and more complicated dynamic. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I get that. I get that. But it, again, it's the I you know I can't speak on behalf of Palestinian uh, protesters, uh, or rather, people protesting about Palestine uh, on American campuses. But wouldn't they say? 
or most of them say, well, we're not. Prote- most of us aren't protesting about Zionism per se. Yes. We're protesting about this they would. microcosm of, of, of they, they, what they, they describe as well, a genocide. Well, they, they would. But here's, here's the even trickier psychological problem, which is that very few racists admit they're racists or, yeah, okay. or say they're racists, yeah. right? I mean, they say that they're just opposing Zionism. Mm. Well, Zionism is a very complicated question. And, you know, most, and, and specifically the International Holocaust Remem- Remembrance Alliance's uh, definition of anti-Semitism, it does include, you know, certain forms of anti-Zionism as mm. forms of anti-Semitism. Yeah. Now, you know, it is, of course, you know, when you're uh, uh, on the barricades in Princeton or in Columbia, yeah. or, you don't say, yeah, I'm a racist, I'm an anti-Semite. No, no, but I am. wouldn't they say, well, look at look at what we're asking for, which is for a divestment from investment. That's in- not all they're asking for. Though. Well, uh, well, that's their core demand of the universities, well, isn't it? it, it because it, the it, other uh, stuff uh, they're asking for is out of their hands, isn't it? Yeah, yeah but they are demand. But hang on, they are actually. Well, let me finish the. Let me yeah, finish, right, the, finish point. the thought. They're asking for divestment in the in the government of uh, in in Israel in the state of Israel to damage the economy of Israel. Perfectly legitimate demand. Yes, and 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 it's got nothing to do necessarily with yeah, the broader but it, question but it, of Zionism. But I think it would be idle to deny that that is not what they spend most of their days doing. What they right. spend most of their days doing when they're in these encampments is shouting about from the river to the sea mm. and Zionism being, you know, an innately racist endeavour. And, you know, I, I mean, I heard a a, a, a a student, I think it was on the, um, you know, uh, the Today programme, I believe from Columbia, talking about how, you know, it, basically Israel would just have to cease to exist and the Jews would have to go somewhere else. Now, really? Yeah, um, yeah, and I could tell from the woman's voice that she was a she certainly considered herself to be a compassionate, kindly, and decent person. Mm. And the problem is, and it does come back to David Baddiel's "Jews Don't Count," is that in the end, people do not see, will not accept Jewish people as a minority, as an ethnic minority. And until you get to that point. It's impossible, really, to make any progress. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's a there's a whole. I mean, without going into the whole detail, there's this whole idea that Jews are essentially right, uh, white, wrong, mm. simply incorrect. Right. There's an idea that they are powerful versus the powerless. Well, maybe with respect to Gaza, but n- you know, Israel is surrounded by hostile countries. Yes. You know, and Jews have had. 2000 years of persecution so absolutely yeah so you know no, but you know it's really important because this has slotted and this i think is one of the reasons why this your point about this the spread of this is that it slots in wrongly but neatly into an incredibly prevalent contemporary template which is power powerful versus powerless oppressor versus oppressed but in so uh, look, I agree completely with that with the the error of that general narrative, and obviously that's the grounding of all of the prejudice against the Jewish people. Going, you know, th- you can go through Hitler, through through all of them. It's all based on this idea that there's something devious and powerful, and there's a conspiracy, and they're they're the problem, you know. Mm. So yes, but in this case, where you've got people seeing. This the scale of the retribution against a an impoverished and very vulnerable society that is that where it's now hard to separate from who the people who are being punished and the people who committed the the crime Hamas where you've got more than thirty or maybe forty thousand people dead isn't it fair to say well in this instance Israel clearly is the powerful. And, and and the Palestinian people are the powerless and they are getting absolutely brutalised. Isn't, isn't that a fair reaction? Two responses to that. First of all, Hamas from Gaza is a proxy mini state of Iran, right? This Fine, is, but, right, you, no, but you're hold avoiding on. the question. No, I'm not avoiding the question. I'm, I'm, I, I totally acknowledge that what's happened in Gaza and is happening in Gaza today as we speak is an appalling slaughter. Yeah. But... I want to put a question back to you, which is ever since October the 7th, 
front page of newspapers, news bulletins, we have seen the face of Benjamin Netanyahu, and rightly so, thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times. Indeed, we've seen him again this yeah, week yeah. because of the question of whether the ceasefire, which is still in active negotiation, uh, will go ahead. We almost never see ever the face of a man called Yaya Sinwa. Mm -hmm. Why is his face not on the front page of newspapers all over the world? Who is this man? He is the head of Hamas in Gaza. Mm. He has been the head of Hamas in Gaza since 2017. He planned October the 7th. He also, and this was a piece of, just in terms of military planning, a piece of bloodless but brilliant planning. He prepared the battlefield in advance because he knew Israel would retaliate and he had built five kilometers of tunnels where Hamas personnel could go but not civilians and since October the 7th he has done everything in his power to stop uh, Palestinian civilians from being evacuated he has shot them he has uh, aimed mortars at them yeah. during the pause last year Sinwa moved 300,000 Palestinian civilians back into harm's way. Mm. He also is, you know, one of his lieutenants, Ghazi Hamad, said in November of October the 7th, we will do it twice and three times. Now, all I'm saying is when you're up against, first of all, why is this guy never yeah. asked to do something ever? I mean, you never read, you never, ever read or see a protest saying, when will Sinwa you know end the conflict isn't isn't that because i mean i i, I can't explain 100 percent, but isn't some of the rationale f behind that the fact that this guy would be seen as clearly evil and not not somebody who you would present as the solution well, to anything but, yeah but hang on a minute i mean i suppose you you know yeah, bin laden through, was a we've been through seven know. months of israel's evil yeah you know at what point does Yaya Sinwa yeah. become the and, and also I don't think that he but, is but your point but for that logic to work in this in in the parameters of my question around the the asymmetry of the of the vengeance right well, well hang on the AC you could call it the asymmetry of the vengeance yeah. what was the appropriate retaliation well, I, don't, I, don't, I mean I don't, I don't know but, but no probably, one ever does no when, but probably not killing 15,000 children what going will was the appropriate symmetry to go across the border and kill 1200 civilians take 150 well, no, back obviously well, what was not, it then well well yes but are you, you're not denying are you that there is an asymmetry I mean, there's always well, been an asymmetry in the it, response. Of course. But but that that is what, when you are, we're not talking here, remember, we're not talking here about a, a, a terrorist incursion by a force that's thousands of miles away normally. We're yeah. talking about next door neighbours. We're yeah, talking yeah. about, uh, you know, what, what Jewish people can see literally over the horizon. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. what was the reasonable, proportionate response to what happened on October the 7th, the sexual violence, the murder of infants. Yeah. I, you don't, know. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. No one does, know. but this is the problem. Is I don't it? know, no. but I don't buy the argument that because I can't answer that question and nobody can. I don't buy the argument that that is, equals carte blanche to any response. No, I don't think it means carte blanche. And by the way, and again, this is a very unpopular point, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm digging myself a hole here. The, the ratio of combatants to civilians killed in Gaza, though still horrific, is way lower than it is has been in other conflicts. I mean, what you have here is a situation where Hamas wanted to stop a shift towards a two-state solution, and it wanted Israel to do something that would make that an impossibility for a generation. And it's probably succeeded. Mm. It's probably succeeded in an objective. But what you have to remember is that the minute that October the 7th happened, no reasonable person could expect is Israelis ever again to negotiate with Hamas. Mm. So for all the talk of let's have a ceasefire, let's have a two-state solution. Okay, a ceasefire, but is Hamas still operative? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Two-state solution. Forget it. It's not going to happen. You know, I I really hope it happens in my lifetime, yeah. but I'm less sure because Hamas uh, and at the moment 
the full yeah. spectrum yeah. of Israeli political opinion is against it. Isn't there a bit of... Yeah, no, look, I think that's totally right. But isn't there a conflation between... or? In the, in the in the in those arguments about what what's the right response, what should Israel do, what 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 is the future with Hamas still in existence? Right? Isn't that helping to conflate Hamas with the people of Palestine? No, because I you know we accept Hamas's thirty thousand civilians dead, right? Yeah. Well, let's accept for now the IDF's report that it has managed to disable 20 of 24 Hamas battalions yeah, right yeah. it is very close yeah. to degrading Hamas as a mili- as a viable military force right yeah. this is why the incursion into Rafah which in fact has already begun is so contested because you know the west is saying look you know stop it you've done enough Netanyahu and not just Netanyahu by the way some of the uh, politicians who are proposed as as more biddable successes like Benny Gantz are saying exactly the same mm. until we get into Rafa and we get the the last remaining leaders of Hamas the job is not done yes now what's interesting here is that and we haven't really mentioned this yet but it, it sort of gets us back into real events is that Joe Biden has made a massive announcement in that he has said categorically in the CNN interview that he won't supply israel with weapons to bombard rafa yeah now that's a big moment it's less and, and it's worth pausing just to talk about what weapons we're talking about because yeah, they, they, they are they're two thousand and five thousand pound bombs yes yeah but the reason yeah. again it's not it's not I'm, targeted highly targeted i'm in danger of becoming an idf spokesman which i don't want to be <laughs> but the reason that those bombs are necessary is because zimwa had built such a subterranean yeah. tunnel network but right? isn't biden saying the bloody obvious which is if you drop two thousand pound bombs anywhere to blow up a tunnel you're going to kill shed loads of innocent civilians yeah, as well yes he and is it's oh, not going to happen yes uh, and well it, it, it <laughs> isn't that reasonable except that again you know and and, and I, I know you, you you've adopted the position that you don't have to come up with an alternative strategy what are the israelis well, well, meant, well, meant I'll tell, okay let me meet you halfway and say what would be super helpful is if there was a sense of what would happen after okay, israel well, as, as all right. considers the job done right well now we're at the bone i really think this is the most interesting bit so i think there will be a ceasefire i think that we're actually closer to it than has been reported that we came very close at the beginning of the week and then Hamas rewrote it Netanyahu said not Nianelli but the CIA director William J Burns is practically living down there at the moment and yeah. although it is always complicated I think that the prospect of a ceasefire is better than it's ever been the question is what happens next and who is in charge now the the worrying thing about what the Biden administration wants to do, conscious of legacy, is it wants to get immediately going with two state solution talk, and 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 this I think is really not good. Is is a is a trilateral Saudi Israel U S agreement sort of the finish off the Abraham Accords that yeah. President Trump started. I I think that. That, 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 that's a ridiculous way to look at it. It's far too big scale. The first thing that needs to happen is that we need a massive Marshall Plan style infrastructural reconstruction plan that's going to last five to ten years. For and that, Gaza, yeah. For Gaza. Yeah. And that is in the ceasefire document that's doing the rounds, and that's good. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to cost the international community a lot of money and yeah. money yeah. money well yeah. spent, yeah. right? The trickier business, and to this I don't have an answer to, is who runs Gaza sort of pro tem. The suggestion is a mixture of Egypt, Qatar and UN. Mm. We'll see, right? And then the final question, which is the important one, is where do we find a Palestinian actor, a group, an agency with whom... Israel can negotiate yeah, yeah. because once this stops and one hopes it stops much sooner rather than yeah. much later there are going there's going to have to be a, a, a new Palestinian entity with which Israelis can yeah. step by step yeah 
um, negotiate. But, but of course, sadly, and this is just an inevitable consequence of what's happened, whoever's right, whoever's wrong, is that the levels of hostility now. Yes. I mean, you've got you've got tens of thousands, whichever number you believe, but you've got tens of thousands of people who have been orphaned, widowed, yeah. who's, who've lost children, who are deeply, deeply psychologically embittered now against Israel. You know, if they, if, if they wanted to... Traumatise Israel. You know, and the same on the other side yes. as well. You've got, yeah. you've got Israel... Who, this is why I, I, I keep coming... I mean, I... Slightly in in order to steel man things, I, I I always try in these in these debates to put the Israeli point of view because very few people do right? right, and the fact is that you know what happened on October the seventh, which has largely been not erased, but it, it's been put aside as it was a horrible thing, but Israel has massively overreacted. The idea that mass Israel is a, is 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 the overreactor is a familiar thing for people people feel comfortable saying that right. it fits into the box but what, can i just pause you just one just for one second because i didn't feel like that but i do now so i've been on a journey i remember listening to johnny friedland's podcast and, and yeah. being absolutely won over by his uh co-host's argument that you know people keep saying there's a clock there's a timetable on israel yeah. people are always Tell it, checking Israel, and that was rooted in a kind of supranational anti-Semitism. You know, it was kind of like Israel was treated as a special case, and I've bought into that, and I sort of, and I still do, generally speaking. But again, on the specifics of what's happened in the last seven months, as time has gone on, I just look absolutely bewildered at the base fact that. You know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand innocent but, people have okay. died. What it isn't is bewildering. It may be, in your view, horribly unethical and wrong, mm. right? But it isn't bewildering. Well, it bewilders me. Well, I mean, because were there, were there, because that was th this is the conflict that was set up by October the seventh. Yes, October no, the seventh was a, an, an ingenious step forward. I mean, it, 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 nothing like it had been seen, perhaps since my lie or something i don't know what the, the, but that that isn't really a, a proper precedent yeah it guaranteed that the israelis would have to eradicate hamas from gaza mm. which of course as you imply is a task that involved would in necessarily involve the deaths of many civilians mm. and as i keep coming back to this no one you know it, seven months of thousands of articles hundreds of podcasts no one has come up with a solution that does not really mean just israel stop no no one has come up with a plan for what israel would do if it stopped completely now yeah. and hamas continued to be yes. an active force yes. in gaza okay i mean look obviously it's 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 bloody complicated and the other thing that i can hear people kind of screaming at the whatever headphones whatever they listen to this podcast on is is that you know we're discussing this as though october the 7th was day one you know and of course there's a very compelling argument to say no 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 you've got to look much further back and this is everything is a reaction and a reaction and a reaction and it's escalated in its reaction and you know i just think there's a valid argument for people to say in this in this case i I, my conviction is that the people of Palestine have been treated badly for a long time. Hamas is a, a reaction to that treatment. We can then go further back and say, well, the reason Israel treats uh, Hamas like that is a reaction to the way they've been treated. And you can take it back as far as you like, but it becomes a very circular argument. And at some point, someone's got to be the big guy and break out of that circularity. And I'm obviously, I'm not saying you know, there would be no reaction and that Israel would be expected to turn the other cheek to what Hamas did of course not but has my question is has what Israel's done since October the 7th made a longer term solution for either people closer or further away I don't know but I also I always balk at the idea that it's only Israel's responsibility to find a longer term solution but the, I, well, the, I'm I'm I mean you, you said just, earlier but you said earlier yeah. that you know the leader of Hamas was an evil man yeah right yeah which is basically saying he's over here yeah. with all the evil guys 
Well, no, I'm saying he is... He, right, he, OK, but, you know, Hamas is an evil... Evidently. Hamas is an evil and irrational force, whereas Israel is part of the family no, of nations. No, I said he was an evil man. Well, this guy who and, drags 300,000 people to be to be victims, you know, yes, and to and, accelerate and, the, tr- the drama and the, and and, the but, crisis. But is hang evil. on, yeah, and he had 4,000 people, some of them civilians, behind him in 22 incursion points on October the 7th. I mean, yeah. what... The problem in all of these things is what I always call unpalatable truths, right? Mm. There is a very familiar way of discussing the Middle East, and it has mostly it has mostly prevailed since October the 7th. And by the way, if you want me to criticise Israel, the biggest criticism I would make of them, other than, you know, I reg- obviously I regret the, 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 the loss of life in Gaza, but, the, but the, the biggest criticism has been a total failure of public diplomacy. Netanyahu has been a disaster in explaining to the world what's going on. Mm. And specifically, it was a grotesque error not to allow Western journalists and other journalists to go embedded with the IDF into Gaza. So they can say, this is why we're doing this. This is why we're doing that. As it is, people's impression of what's going on in Gaza has been wholly crafted by Hamas, Palestinian civilians, Palestinian journalists, you know, and I think that for that, Israel will pay a price, actually. It was a very bad decision. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's been... Uh, there's been ammunition, uh, metaphorically speaking, that that the Palestinian journalists have been handed by some of the behaviour by the IDF. But that point about not coming enough from Netanyahu about what the solution is and what the plan is, is is where I was trying to meet you halfway before, which is if if because the, right now the plan just looks like wipe Gaza off the face of the earth. No, I that's don't what it looks like. It may look like it, but it isn't. I mean, look. Israel is a military giant, yeah, right? Yeah. If it wanted to wipe Gaza off the face of the earth, if it really was committed to what people call genocide, this would look even worse, right? I mean, I know it is extremely unfashionable to say this, but in fact, the IDF, you know, it handed out leaflets, it called people on their phones, it it hovered drones over areas saying this is going to be, this area is going to be attacked. Which other country ever has done something like that? Well, Iran did it when it was attacking Israel. It or, telegraphed its attack, didn't it? All right, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, it, it, though not to the civilians. But OK, I, but what I'm saying is that there, there was a direct attempt to minimise civilian casualties, yeah. right? But the fact is that we have we've forgotten what warfare is like. You know, if you make an attack like October the 7th, there is... A very high likelihood that, and you know, that basically the Second World War was this. You know, yeah, the outcome yeah. is going to involve civilian death on a scale that yeah. is really, really difficult to take. And now we have technology that that presses it into our faces all the time. Yeah. And the the bigger question, and this is for another day when things are calmer and you know, hopefully something like peace is returned, is is it actually possible to? Uh, fight wars like this yeah. you know I mean or, or or is the reality that you know Israel Israel will just have to accept that it can't do stuff like this if it wants to remain part of the international community and if it's told that will it want to remain part of the international community yeah. I mean I hope it does but but I I, I must say that I I think that the, the, the framing has been skewed yeah okay well <laughs> we started bit of, a about domest- rip- bit of a domestic there. Ripples in a pond and the ripples have extended no, even but it's as good. far it's, it's as really, the two It's mats. really important. And I'll tell you yeah. why it's important. It's because I think that because we respect each other, I think it's, we can say these things without fear or favour. Yeah, totally. what, what worries me about this war is that the, the kind of discussion we've just had happens almost never. Yeah, yeah. Right, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like we've probably changed each other's minds by five percent. Yeah, but that's a start. No, no, for sure. I'm just right. The conversation. I mean, the other point I want to make is that our conversation, the students on the campuses, the universities divesting from Israel, the the protests in London every weekend, none of it matters. Really, <laughs> none of it makes any difference. Really, what will make a difference is governments. Yes, uh, you're right. Talking together, yeah, and 
and and putting pressure on both sides to I mean I think the time has come where there's got to be some pressure and some leverage well I think that's you, that, you're seeing that from Biden yeah, now yeah and actually you know one of the one of the interesting things about this is that it's unusual for Biden to do this it's not actually that unusual for American presidents I mean Reagan and Bush senior frequently yeah. um you know uh clouted israel and said you can't have this unless you do that and it's for, you know th- there is scope always for the american israel relationship to be used as a lever yeah. in this yeah. and i and i i wouldn't be um pessimistic about that well um yeah. do you know i mean my only optimism and it feels terrible saying even using the phrase optimism in in the middle no, of I don't such think horror, you didn't, no. but the optimism that, that it feels like we are at rock bottom and it feels like the only way is up from here. But well, I think what's happening is that the detail of the ceasefire is actually now so great that it's it's beginning to develop the form of a immediate post-conflict plan. Yeah. And these things, which is not to say that by the next time we meet for a podcast, you know, everything will have been sorted. Yeah. But I do think that that we, we, we are at... Ver- Let's put it no more than this. We are we're at a fork in the road, and I think that there is a thirty percent chance that that we might get a ceasefire quite quickly. I would put it no higher than that, but that's higher than I would have thought of at any stage so far. Well, let's end it on that positive note. There we'll, you go. we'll come back. We've reached a fork in the road, and we're going to come back after a short break with something totally different, and totally cultural. different, and jolly. Yeah. So, retrospectors, what historical events are we ticking off on this week's run of Today in History? Well, on Tuesday, we head to the battlefields of medieval Spain to witness the very first ambulance. On Wednesday, it's the anniversary of the day Coca-Cola's creator hit on his winning formula. He dropped the wine, but kept the cocaine. On Thursday, the thief who stuffed the crown jewels down his trousers. And on Friday, when free-spirited Danish parenting put 90s New York in a tears. We discuss this and more on Today in History with the Retrospectors. Ten minutes every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. So, Matt, you have come back from seeing a stage production of my favourite film in history ever. You know what? I had a... Such a good trip. It was I uh, went up to Birmingham Rep, which is a great theatre, and a wonderful place to launch this new stage production of Bruce Robertson's With Lil and I, which I think possibly for our generation is like holy writ, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, m- many a centrist dad has irritated people yeah. by quoting at length, yes. you know, are you the farmer? Well, I, uh, just to say, I watched it with my 17-year-old daughter. Did enjoy it? Who loved it. Oh, she so absolutely loved I, I mean, it, I have to know? say, I think it does get through the Checkpoint Charlie of generational, yeah. to, because my kids both love it yeah. too. So so it's not, and that's actually relevant to, to what I, I thought. Uh, so Bruce Robertson has always resisted the idea of staging this the, the movie. And the movie is, it's a funny one, really, because nothing much happens in it. It's about two struggling actors subsisting on booze and speed in yeah. Camden Town in 1969 yeah. and they decide that they are dr- drifting into the arena of the unwell and that they're <laughs> going to go on holiday to um, Withnall who's played by Richard E. Grant his, his, un- his uncle Monty who's played by Richard Griffiths has a remote cottage in Cumbria and they're going to go there for a holiday and it's all horrible and then uh, Uncle Monty turns up and the place transforms into a sort of you know English eccentrics paradise yeah. and Uncle Monty makes a move on I, who is played by Paul McGann, also yeah. called Marwood in the script, and uh, the, then they go home. Yeah, which really doesn't capture the sort of m- magic and the dialogue <laughs> and the music. And so, uh, you know, it's taken Robinson a long time to commit himself to this. And I think what made the difference was Sean Foley, who's a brilliant he's the artistic director of Birmingham Rep, yeah. kind of persuaded Bruce Robinson, we can do this. And more to the point, it, it won't just be a sort of bloodless reenactment of the movie. You know, it'll have its own life. Right. You know, it'll be true to the script, and the script is mostly right. um, uh, the same. There are bits and bobs yeah. that have changed, but not nothing much. Have they carried it off? And they have. Wonderful. I mean, I'll tell you why I think it works. So, so number one, the people that play the main parts, Robert Sheehan plays with Null, Adonis Sadiqe plays Marwood Stroke I, and Malcolm Sinclair plays Uncle Monty. And it's really to their credit that they don't just mimic the movie performances. Yeah. So 
you know i mean obviously the characters have their own boundaries but but it's it's not like watching the film on stage at all. Yes. And then there are, there are lots of fun things like the, the the set design is is incredibly ingenious because if you think about you know they're on the road in yeah. in, in 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 Marwood's uh, Jag, Jag Mark yeah. Two and yeah. and you know they're 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 in the countryside up at Crow and Crag up How'd at Crow Crag, Crag yeah. and Jake the Poacher you yeah. know yeah. here We've here gone here. On holiday by mistake. We've gone on holiday. Are you the farmer? Of course he's the <laughs> fucking farmer. With will stop saying that and. And one of the things that I thought made it was a particularly clever idea, simple, but just made it more vivid and real. And now was they've got a very good live band playing the music, oh, the original really? music. So oh, you've got and that really, really works. So it gives it. Do a they kind, do that lovely melodic theme? They do oh. a wide shade of pale. They yeah. do the Hendrix classics. Oh. And, and, and so it's um, it, it has this kind of. Uh, sense that it's breathing life into you know it's a production in its own really? right it's breathing life into uh, a, a movie we all love yeah it, it, you know it is homage to the movie there's yeah. no question about it but it has its own life and i really hope it gets to tour and then i really yeah. hope it gets a west end transfer oh, you, it, know? It, you know it is it is really i really admire them because yeah. you know with is uh, to an almost crazy extent treated as holy writ you know yeah. and 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 this breaks the crust yeah. of reverence well it's set in in camden or starting camden it, in 1969 69. which is the yeah. year i was born so there's it's, nothing it, it's kind of feels like the world when i was four or five you know it's that kind of i magic I, nostalgia but it, it's such a great film it, it is and it, it's about it's a very moving film because it's I think Robinson is semi-autobiographical about the, his yeah. early life as a struggling actor. But it's also about his c- simultaneous contempt for and absolute love of English eccentricity. Yes. And it's also a, 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 a movie stroke play about endings. Oh. You know, the end of a decade, the end of yeah. um, a social order, yeah. the, the end of friendship. Yeah. And as uh, Danny, the drug yeah. dealer says uh, very well played in this uh says uh the greatest decade in the history of humanity is coming to an end man and as presuming ned here has so consistently pointed out we have failed to paint it black <laughs> and <laughs> i i don't know why but that particular that, yeah. elegiac line always puts a lump in my throat well the bit that puts a i'm more basic than you and the bit that always puts a lump so. in my throat is the very last scene where he oh. stands outside the london zoo with, Henry, with the wolves and i've found i mean i have found the exact railings he stands by right. and i've found the exact bench that you walk past and it's and and because it's very it's easy to sort yes, of track yeah. it and of course the wolves are no longer in that bit yes of the that's zoo. right yeah it's near the penguin enclosure now but where he starts reading from hamlet and the rain starts coming down. I have a fleet, they were for I know not. Uh, all of the, and walks off, and you just think, oh my God, you know, it's you, a you bit know, of all of us there. You know? In the original uh, script that Robinson was going to shoot, Withnall goes back to his flat and kills himself. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, which would have been well, a big mistake yeah, yeah. because the, the, yeah. the, 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 the movie and, and the stage play, I don't want to sort of spoil how they do it, but yeah. carries off this, this sense of, of, of melancholy as well. Yeah. Is 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 the sense that people do just part? Yeah, part, it's about sunderings and partings and the yeah. sadness and the richness of experience and it's great. It's great. And so it was all produced. The film was all produced by the great late George Harrison. Yeah, I mean, and and would not have happened without George Harrison. And it's wonderful that also there were some fantastic early miscasting ideas, like having. Daniel Day Lewis as Withnall, oh, which really? would have required you know sixteen months of preparation, and you know uh, uh, Kenneth Branner as well. I think was in. Library. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that that would have been interesting, Branner. Would it, I mean that would have changed Branner's career completely? It would, but you know, there's something about I, I think Richard E. Grant sort of almost he's, cadaverous. Yeah, it's perfect. You yeah. know, uh, the scene where he's applying the um, imbrication, imbrication, um, the liniments and, all over him, and yeah. wonderfully because he's teetotal, of course. Yeah, yeah, so playing yeah. a drunkard was yeah. was was amazing. Was, was, but it's a great film. But you know, Harrison was too tight to pay for the Robinson had written in scenes for obviously expensive scenes filming on the motorways. Right. The dr- the actual drive to Crag. Yeah. Cra- uh, Crow Crag, Crag. Yeah. And and Harrison was too tight, so Robinson paid for those scenes himself. Bloody hell. And and cut them in. And of course, you you kind of think. Without that linking scene of them driving through the night with the rain lashing in on the jag, you know, and all of that, it would have it would have really kind of been an unsettling transition from 
Uncle Monty's to straight into Crow Crag. It but, would have been, yeah. yeah no, you but, need that. Yes, and he knew that, and he said, no, the hell And then on I'm the paying. way back, yeah. I'm making time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so, ridiculous. My my cousin's a QC. Can you make another man? <laughs> Sorry, this is very... Uh, but Well, but, I wonder if there's anybody listening who hasn't seen With No Other Night. Well, if you, if you yeah. haven't, you're missing a treat, and yeah. I hope that this play comes. But I, I think there's just... I mean, it... It is in an you know, it's of itself. It's there's no other film like it. Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it, that 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 some of these great movies are now being transferred to uh, to play, so or, yeah. or, or TV series. So yeah. we're looking forward to Boys from the Black stuff. Amazing. Um, which is coming up, which has been adapted from Alan Bleasdale's yeah. classic. Yeah. Uh, coming to the National Theatre in May on May twenty second after a successful and run you've bought Liverpool. us tickets for that. I have. Can't uh, wait. Yeah. That's. That's a timely big segue. Another segue. <laughs> oh, oh, great segue to which we are justly celebrated. To R.I.P. Bernard Hill. Yeah, yeah. Who played Yossa Hughes, gives yeah. a job in the original and timelessly classic. Yeah. Can I clear something up about the word Yossa? Just briefly. I would love it if you did. Mark Lawson read yes. a, re- a very good re- uh, obituary of Bernard Hill. Yes. And talked about the character, obviously, Yozza Hughes, and said that since Boys from the Black stuff, the name Yozza as a nickname has has carried on, you know, and he knew somebody called Hughes from Liverpool who was called Yozza. But the, the gag is that everybody in Liverpool, for a time in memoriam, who's called Hughes, which is pronounced Hughes, is called Yozza. It's just oh, a Liverpool... It's, it's like, everyone's called Yozza. So it's the like gag Smitty is Smitty like, or... Uh, yeah, but it's calling him Yozza Hughes is like Yozza Yozza or Hughes Smitty, Hughes. Smitty, Smitty, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. but it's, it's, it, it, that's one thing Alan Bleasdale can't claim credit for, is inventing is, the oh, right, right, that's, but that's yeah. very interesting. So yeah. Bernard Hill, who, you know, went on to have all sorts of acting credits in movies and big series died on sunday but what a what an exit he made because we've both yeah. been enjoying um, responder the martin freeman tony schumacher yeah uh, tv series yeah. season two of the responder yeah in which bernard hill yeah plays uh tom who is the father of chris, chris who's the, the copper copy, played yeah. by martin freeman yeah and well, I'll leave it to you to explain why it's so brilliant. Why well, I mean, uh, well, he's he's brilliant because he brings that. I mean, Bernard Hill is brilliant for a start because always because he he has the and I forget what Mark Lawson said, but it was something about a sort of controlled rage that could turn at any yeah, moment. Yeah, exactly. And there is a moment in you, you'll know. I won't spoil it for people, no, but, but there's it, a moment in I think the third episode it where is. Bernard Hill his acting in this scene gobsmacking is oh my god you know it's like oh, wow it's incredible and it's brutal and it's but but where the uh as any as i'm sure bernard hill were alive to say so w- would admit is that it's the genius of the writing that facilitates that yes incredible turn of of acting and Stunning this guy writing. tony schumacher is a genius stands alongside alan bleasdale no and, i mean as it, far as it, i'm concerned he you know, one wonders, is he the new Alan Bleasdale? Yeah, well, quite easily. Because if to describe this as a cop drama... Nah, is, it's, it, it's so it, much more than that. It'd be like describing King Lear as an episode of Neighbours. You know, it's, it's not... It's absolutely intense and incredible. It's a, it's a state of the nation. Isn't it? it? It's riveting. And the final example of this trend is um, to come later in the year, in October, which is uh, Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove is going on stage oh really as reimagined by Amanda Iannucci and Sean Foley who did the with and all at, in Birmingham have I, am I imagining that Steve Coogan's in that and that... Steve Coogan yeah. is is taking the Peter, Peter Sellers, Sellers role, role. Yes, so we'll right. see yeah. I mean you know what a team and yeah. and I guess there's a there's a sort of interesting question here which is is it all this sort of putting of, of 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 old TV series, films, whatever, onto the stage. Is it just nostalgia, lack of courage, squeezing as much juice as you can out of old intellectual property? And certainly, you know, if you if you walk down Shaftesbury Avenue now, there are musicals and things that are based on movies and yeah. you, you really wish they wouldn't. They weren't. Yeah, yeah. But I sort of feel in these three cases, with no Boys from the Black stuff, Doctor Strange Love, there's... It, it's good to see them being b- b- fresh life being brought. I mean, to take, um, you know, we've talked about Boys in the Black stuff a lot on the podcast as yeah. a sort of reference point and a kind of the, the, the kind of alarming echoes yeah. today yeah. about the social fabric. 
But, you know, strange love. This week, Putin ordered nuclear drills. Yeah, yeah. Who would have thought no. in 1964, when Kubrick's film came out, that in 2024 yeah. it would be still Living out, horrifically yeah. relevant? Well, I, I tell you what I think the answer to why, why this phenomenon is that all the money suddenly has gone towards TV series. Yes. You know, Amazon and Disney and Paramount and 100%. all of Netflix, obviously. And that's where the talents gravitated to. So what you're seeing is absolutely first. I mean, and not just recently. Oh, we're talking maybe the last 20 years. The West Wing, The Sopranos, you know, uh, Breaking Bad, The Wire. You know, these absolutely time immemorial classics that uh, that would in another time have been made as movies first yeah. I guess because that's where the money was that's true and the money's moved to TV and so now all this is where all the the amazing artwork is happening and it's it's a glorious time for television it is and and I you know I I like the idea of of of, of staging of things you know the, with the proviso I suppose that going to the theater is expensive yeah um but but it's it, it's nice to see the, the I guess it's quality isn't it I mean yeah. it, when it's classics like this it's hard to object to them give being given no. a different and, and not all of them will work and I by guess. the way I must tip my hat towards you because half of this stuff I read now having read your wonderful cultural column each week oh, well, where you, very much. your the tip newsletter. sheet well yeah. the um in which with Noel and i uh the stage play and the responder will both figure this brilliant. brilliant it's out today friday brilliant and uh available to uh to presently new european sub subscribers, subscribers. just so. another great reason to subscribe quick hat tip to um ripley as well on netflix which oh isn't it great? It was absolutely wonderful. I mean, you know, tremendous. And again, yeah. an, another example of um, how reinterpretation can... Because, um, yeah. you know, a lot of people have played Ripley from not just Matt Damon, but Alan Delon and uh, John Malkovich. And I didn't know until I was looking into the, the Netflix series, because I enjoyed Andrew Scott's interpretation. Yeah, brilliant. I didn't know Dennis Hopper. No had a go, yeah. Had he really? Yes, he did. I mean, Den I mean, I haven't yet. I've yet to see the the, the version. I must well, catch up with it. But I find it very very difficult to imagine old crazy Dennis as. Do you know uh, the Ripley. oddest fact about Dennis Hopper is that he's mad about transcendental meditation. He's, Dennis Hopper was crazy about TM. He's absolutely he's dead now. Yeah, or he was. He's transcending. Transcendental he has now meditation. transcended everything. Really, <laughs> he's yogi flying off to the, another plane. But well, he was yeah, and he and he used to fund like anybody he'd met, he would like put them on a TM. Course. I suppose the truth is that you know when you've ingested as much, <laughs> <laughs> when you've been as chemically challenged as Dennis, yeah. you've got to get obsessed by something else, haven't you? <laughs> you need the anyway, yeah. R.I.P. and R.I.P. Um, the uh, great Bernard the, Hill. The great Bernard Hill, because really. You you know, they don't, they broke the mould with that one, I think. Gives a job. I can do that. I can do that. So, Matt, thank you as ever for another, cha well, challenging this time, but... Uh, challenging and jolly. Still enjoyable conversation. Laced with optimism. Yeah. You have to find it, but if, it's there. If you found this conversation stimulating, get your questions, any feedback into the two mats. that's the number two, M-A-T-T-S, at tnepublishing.com two mats at tnepublishing.com or if you listen on Spotify you can message us there and that's what John did and he says first listen now on the roster not a question but thank you John that's uh, well thank that's you good. we've had loads of good feedback actually from listeners so much obliged thank you very much for all the positive response if you like it tell everybody you know and, and subscribe and like the show whatever you need to do We'll have loads of questions and answers in our usual Q&A session on Sunday, so please uh, join us then. And remember our subscription offer. If you like the Two Mats podcast, I personally guarantee you will love getting the New European newspaper every week. Go to theneweuropean.co.uk forward slash Two Mats, number two, M-A-T-T-S, and there's a link in the show notes. Thank you to producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio with support from Ollie Peart. And until next week... It's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from him. Goodbye. goodbye.